May 12th, 1988, as part of the oral history program for the Hastings Historical Society regarding his life in Hastings and especially on the waterfront. Where, uh, where were you born? Uh, in New York City, on 126th Street on Morningside Avenue. <laughs> and what, what did your parents do? Uh, my parents. My father was a baker, and uh, he ran what was called the New York Baker Club. In fact, this was a uh, uh, an employment, and it, uh, I'm trying to think. You see, it's too many years now. Uh, it was called the New York Baker Club. I gather it was incorporated in the early 1900s. So, uh, and he operated out of 62 East 124th Street, which is between Park and Madison. And it employed bakers for uh, Manhattan, the Bronx, Brooklyn, and Westchester. Uh, even uh, at the A&P, and years ago it used to be Hans Come. And uh, I'm trying to think of the other one. Uh, it was a larger bakery. I can't even think of the name. But this was his background. So uh, My mother came from Europe at the age of two, and uh, she came from uh, trying to think of the name of the town, uh, in Germany, where Mercedes is made, Stuttgart, Stuttgart, Germany, and my father, came from the Swiss border at the age of 12. And uh, how he got here, I don't know. But uh, uh, my mother died in 1929, and my father roughly about 1952. And my mother was 49 at that time, and uh, I was nine. So. Now that would be the background, uh, but uh, they never ever went back to Europe. My father went back to Europe once, and he was born in 1879 or 1878. I had older parents, uh, and uh, he went back once, and uh, he had a stroke coming back on the ship. And uh, we took him off at 57th Street, and he came here, and about three months later, he passed away. It was a massive stroke, so. But that would be the background of my parents. Uh, and do you have any brothers or sisters? One sister who lived in San Mateo, uh, outside of San Francisco, for many years, very similar to this. And she's dead now for uh, the last, I'm trying to think must be six or seven years, and she was a few years older than I was. And uh, outside of that, no one. I have uh, a nephew, and that's it in this country, to my knowledge. When did you move to Hastings? About 1938. I actually moved completely the beginning of 39. I'm acquainted to Hastings since 1937. Uh, more so, uh, I'm starting to say, eh, eh. During the Depression years, we've been working in the plumbing business since 1935. And, uh, Yuck, you know my partner, John, and we've worked together since 1935, in fact, 1934. And I knew York since 1930. Uh, and we started in the plumbing shop in New York together as apprentices, and then later on, went in business up here. 
But uh, more so that we, during the Depression, we used to deliver eggs in Hastings because you couldn't sell them any place. And John's fa father, or Yock's father, had a farm up in Wallingford. And it, it went in from, uh, from Meriden to Middletown in Connecticut. And it was about 80 acres. And uh, they used to have three to 4,000 chickens. And in that era, there wasn't much to feed them, but by the same token, you could wind up with 3,000 eggs and you couldn't give them away. So we used to take them down to New York. At that time, we worked in the city, and I'm going back now, 1937 or so. And uh, we'd take them down, and we'd bring them down on First Avenue to a store, I can't remember the name, and they paid 15 cents a dozen for eggs if you bought them in by the crate, candled and fresh. But we could get 25 cents a dozen up in Hastings, and we used to take it into Paul Bularoski. Do, do you know where Bularoski? No. Uh, that's where the Café de la Gare is today, uh, the French restaurant. And Bularoski, Paul, I have a bronze nameplate downstairs from his cash register. Uh, he'd buy as many as two dozen or two cases a week, which is 60 dozen, 30 dozen for the case. And my father-in-law, Joe Bollinger, used to, uh, Anna could tell more how they bought, how many, but it was quite a bit. So we'd drop it off at my, at that time, uh, Bollinger's, which today is my father-in-law. Uh, and uh, then uh, uh, my mother-in-law, or Mrs. Bollinger, would sell uh, eggs to different friends, and it wasn't a question of sell, they were happy to get. They were good dark brown eggs and excellent. They were usually from large to jumbo. You, if you got a dozen, you could guarantee you had one with a double yolk or something like that. And if you were lucky, you could even hit three yolks. So, but, uh, and again, uh, this was uh, our acquaintance there. Uh, now, uh, Paul Bularoski, his parents had a home where the library and the village hall is today. And they're the people. And I'd rather my wife tell you this, because, uh, again, this was sort of a little tricky, slippery deal. Uh, that uh, if my recollection is correct, and my father-in-law was quite a conversationist, you never had the I realize that meeting my father in law. Uh, and he was very friendly with Bolorowski. And uh, Peggy Bolorowski, his daughter, who has to be close to 80 now. Do you know who I'm speaking about? I, no. no. She lives in one of our buildings on Spring Street, on 5 Spring Street. And uh, she was born and raised where that village hall is. Uh, and that was, he sold that to a Catholic priest. So that's the reason I say, be careful. Repercussion will be tremendous. Uh, a Catholic priest, I can't think of his name, and I know it wasn't Father Hines. And then it was sold to the village through some brokerage house. And that is where the police station is today the library and the whole schmear, but that was their property. But in the meantime, they used to live on above the store prior to that, uh, which is that French restaurant. There are two apartments up there. It's a nice apartment up there. Very generous apartment. Uh, uh, and uh, they had uh, three children. A Louis, who was a chemical engineer, and Paul, who ran the business later, who was an aeronautical engineer. They both went to college. And then there was Peggy. And Peggy Tiersma, for years, took care of the, I hope I say this right now, the cemetery on Soma River Road. God, we worked there for years. And this is a funny, you get old, you forget. Steppenweiss Memorial Home. Yeah, so they were in there for years. Uh, and uh, again, now she, her son's out in California, and he sort of uh, more or less, uh, they're geared to take care of the funeral. 
Uh, Spike, you know, hey, Hi. Anna. How are you? Uh, come on out here. I can't yeah. keep uh, You're better with this garbage than I am. Yeah. I, uh, he asked me, you know, what my derivative was or where I was derived from or what my background is. Okay. Um, how did you meet uh, your wife? My partner, John Demi, is the first cousin to Anna. That is how we met. And I must know Anna since 1933 or so, uh, more so visiting with John years ago. Uh, we'd come up to Hastings. A lot of times, uh, we used to walk up to Hastings. And it's hard to believe, yeah. And uh, John's father, John, and John's brother, Andy, would walk from 87th Street in New York on First Avenue all the way to Hastings, visit, have coffee, have something to eat in the Bollingers, and then turn around and walk back home. This would be on a Sunday. Yeah. How yeah. long did that take? You know, without lying to you, uh, Spike, I can't remember. I do know, for an example, when you say walking, uh, we would get done work at 5 o'clock in the evening, have dinner, and from 149th Street on uh, Southern Boulevard, we'd walk across the Thryborough Bridge to Astoria, go swimming in the Astoria pool, and then walk all the way back uh, to 149th Street, and uh, uh, then go to work in the morning. Get up at 6:30 and be at work by 8 o'clock down on 85th. And uh, uh, as economists, if we needed wrenches in those days, the best place to buy them used to be on 125th Street between Lenox and Seventh Avenue. And we used to come home at 5 o'clock again, have dinner. And then uh, walk down to 125th Street over to 7th Avenue, and God knows where, we'd wind up in the Apollo, and then walk back to 149th Street. And many times, uh, we thought nothing uh, la later on in years, uh, Anna and I, we used to go down to the Apollo, and today I'd be a little frightened. Uh, in fact, I'd be a lot frightened. Uh, what made you decide to move to Hastings? Well, more so due to association. Uh, what made me move totally to Hastings, I got acquainted with Anna, and I liked the particular area, uh, and we happened to go on strike in New York at the time, and temporarily I took a job in Hastings. And I was going to take it for a few weeks and then go back. Uh, and I worked for a fellow by the name of Ed Joyce on Spring Street, right next door to Bollinger's, Bollinger's Barbershop. And uh, on the end of the first week, I didn't get paid because he said he wasn't paid. So on the end of the second week, uh, uh, I got the first week's pay. I can't quite remember, and it just so happened that Jim O'Neill from the Anaconda uh, was speaking to my father-in-law. My father-in-law said he's a plumber. He's looking for part-time work now until it straightens out in New York. And uh, he said, send him down. Maybe we'll give him a, we may have something for him. So I went down to the Anaconda the following day, and... Uh, he gave me a job as a pipe fitter, plumber in the Anaconda. And this was prior to the war. And at that time, the old North Mills that had, still had a rotten wooden floor. You couldn't even walk on it. And that building's 900 feet long and 180 feet wide, and there's about five other annexes to it. But it hadn't been used since World War II. And things were, didn't look too good at that time. It looked gloomy that it was an eventuality that we were going to get into something. 
So Anaconda started cleaning up the North Mill, and that's where I started working. Uh, Charlie Anderson was the contractor, and they came in with bulldozers and tore the floors up, and there were millions, if I say millions, maybe thousands, but I have hands full, I have quite a few hands full today of lead bullets from World War I, because they made bu bullets in that particular mill. Uh, and I stayed there up until the time I went in service, and I was a pipe fitter. I maintained the North Mill. Uh, and uh, I went in service uh, the end of 1942. Uh, I was married in 1941, uh, what we call the Democratic Thanksgiving, which was November 20th. Roosevelt had uh, pulled it back because he felt it was too close to the holidays. So it was two weeks prior to the end of November. And the war started three weeks after I was married. So, and I went in service about a year later. So, uh, What was the waterfront like when you first came to Hastings? To be honest, outside of the Tower Ridge Boat Club, which was clear there, the Buccaneer was in perfect shape. Most boys, and we used to go swimming there, uh, would go swimming uh, off, off, off the Buccaneer. And if you sort of jumped in on one end, you can come out on the other, depending on the tide. If the tide was running out, you went in on the north end, and you came out on the south end, or vice versa. Uh, but... Uh, the only change I would say, to my knowledge of that waterfront, is that bulkhead right there that was never there. All the masts has been taken down from the Buccaneer, and that had all the slings, the ropes, the steering gear, everything was on. It was, it was lovely. And uh, the Anaconda, before the war, they built out. Like, see, when you look down, that's what they call Machine Hall. See that black building going out right now? Mm -hmm. Uh, it has sort of a staggered mm -hmm. Dutch roof there. And you see a pile of rock. If you looked from here in that direction, that wasn't there. Uh, and it went way back, about 100 feet. They went ahead, and that's very deep there, maybe 45 feet deep. I watched them. And they bought barge full of rocks and just kept dumping them, dumping them, and dumping them. It took them about a year and a half to fill that in the way it is right now. And they always use that for scrap copper to burn the rubber off. So all the remnants from the anaconda would go out there first, and they, that was sort of a, a perpetual fire, and they'd, they'd burn the rubber off it, and they'd take the scrap copper and send it back to a smelter, basic anaconda company. But uh, that is the only change. There was a great sandy beach here, and again, that bulkhead has sort of not... It's, it's taken the character out of it. There's still a sandy beach here now. This bridge was very accessible. The same as our bridge right here was very accessible. This burnt about 15 years ago, and we let it burn because we had so much trouble with kids with firecrackers at 4th of July. I'm scared to say the last few years hasn't been bad. More so people up above aren't too acquainted to it. Uh, and they say if it's dry they'll start shooting these rockets and they don't realize they hit here and the next thing you do you have a little fire going so. but anyway uh, i don't know what else to tell you outside of that there's been no change business wise from dock street we've had four changes of address that used to drive us crazy with stationery uh our old number uh, uh my father-in-law's number was 1772 then they came along, and it was Hastings, H-A-1772. Then it was Hastings 5, 1772. And then it was Greenleaf 5. And then it went to 478. Now then, Dock Street, we had 30 Dock Street. We had 60 Dock Street. We had 159 Southside Avenue. Uh, then they swung around to 30 Southside Avenue, then they swung back again to 159 Southside Avenue. These are the different changes. Dri drive you nuts.
Yeah, this was the place where you were working. That's, well, uh, th this was here in Haste. We owned the building. We, uh, but again, uh, see, you, that was always called Dock Street for as many years as I can remember. Bularoski was next door to us. And coming around the corner on Spring Street, now I've got to go back before the war, in the courting days, I'm speaking now 38, 39, 1938, 1939, or 1940, right in there. Uh, I'd come up on a weekend, and I used to sleep in the beauty parlor. They didn't have enough room for me to sleep in the back because I had the girls, so I slept in the beauty parlor. Next door was Wolf's. Uh, it was called Dunn's, but Wolf was the name of the gin mill on Spring Street, and it was quite a gin mill. They had at least three or four bartenders there. You couldn't even get close to the bar. On a, oh, yeah, it's unbelievable. For an example, in traveling, uh, if you were in the Philippines, the Hawaiian Islands, and I don't care if you were in Guam, no matter where you were, if you said you came from Hastings, you'd hear someone say, you know, wolves, that was the password. And it's a funny thing, uh, you know, I think back at, at that, which may not have any reflection. I'm just saying about Wolf's next door. I'll come back to Wolf's. I happen to say that you can be in the, I'm reflecting to my wife in this conversation, uh, that uh, if you said you came from Hastings, they say, do you know Wolf's? And you know, it's a funny thing. I went up to that, uh, to Sunset Rhinebeck, Sunset. to this uh, uh, car show, and a, an old timer had to be uh, 70 to 80 said, oh, you come from Hastings. Do you remember Wolf's? That was the first thing. But uh, for an example, I happened to be coming home. See, a lot of people say, would you live in this awful place with those railroad trains here? But anyway, I happened to be uh, coming home. And... Uh, I heard someone say, anybody from Hastings? And he used to say, Hastings where? Because it could be Hastings. Yeah, in service. Yeah, service. Hastings, Nebraska, no matter where it was. But God, who was it but Phil Gunther? He was coming out to, to the Pacific at the time we were going home. But anyway, uh, this would be uh, of interest. Uh, across the street was Bill Roback, who came here in 1895. And he was, his father was a tailor. And Bill worked for the village on a garbage truck. And there, we used to park our cars in the barn in the back. We had two garages in there. And if, when Bill would come home, and if he couldn't get into the garage, there'd be either motorcycles, a car parked in the driveway. He'd go in and take tape and tape an ice pick onto his shoe. And I've seen him go from the top to the bottom, from the top of Spring Street, down all to the bottom of the hill, just kicking the tires on the inside. And when people came out, they had two flats, usually on the inner street side. Uh, now, going as far as the Christie estate uh, is concerned, uh, we did the work for Christie, and Christie was an economist and quite an individual. Uh, he wouldn't buy domestic water from Nourishell Water Company, so he used to have ramjets, and I'm so sorry I never kept one, but the ramjets were kept on Main Street was a brook, which today runs underneath the A&P sh shopping store, underneath the city bank, and crosses underneath and goes to the side of the hook and ladder on Main Street, and then goes down into the ravine. Uh, Chris Chris Didi had two ram jet pumps that weighed about five pounds. And they were what I would call a perpetual pump. It had a little cup on it. When the cup filled, it would counterbalance it, and the ram would come out. And uh, when the ram came out, it pushed just a little shot of water ahead. And at that point, the bucket would turn and it would be empty and the ram would reset itself and she'd fill and it would run back and forth and every year we used to put new bearings in it which was Babbitt bearings at that time and we'd 
heat the babbit and spill it in, take the pump out and repair them. And that used the pump from there to a tank on the top of a two-story building. This would be the third story, and that was way up the hill. It had to come from the A&P up where the apartment houses are and fill a big 1,500-gallon tank full of water. And uh, that was his water supply, I guess, for 57 years before. And uh, there was Dr. Jenks, Mr. Christie, we always call him Old Man Christie, uh, and another individual, I can't think of his name, used to make steam engines. And they used to make these on Olinda Avenue in Doc Jen's old hospital, which is still on Olinda Avenue, which isn't used today. And they had a whole machine shop. And they'd take these trains, and they used to run them by Christiti. Uh, and uh, it's all gone. I have no idea. Uh, I think the fellow that may have gotten a lathe was uh, Vinny Marchetti's brother, who was dead now. Uh, uh, Spike, I don't know what. When, when did you uh, start your own? When did you move into your own place to work? Uh, start your own plumbing. When did Hastings Plumbing start? December second, nineteen forty-five. We went in full blast. As soon as I came back, uh, and we started. We were in the store. In fact, I rented that store in August when I was still in the Pacific and I paid rent for six months prior to getting here. But again, we started in business December 2nd, 1945. Uh, and we, it was called Freitag and Demi. And we had so many complaints. There was something about the name that didn't suit the village. So we changed it to Modern Plumbing and Heating. And we had painted the window, and we had all the due to pay for the painting, which was 30 or $40. And I don't think it was on the window for four weeks, and someone said, gee, there's a modern plumbing and heating in White Plains. You can't use the name. So then we wanted to make it Hastings Plumbing and Heating. And there was a Hastings Plumbing and Heating, which was actually Mel Haynes, who at, by that time had retired. But it was a registered name in the county. So then we took Hastings Plumbing and Heating Company Incorporated and Incorporated. And that took us about a year and four different paint jobs. And we moved to Dock Street, or South Side Avenue, of what it's called today, in 1948, uh, the beginning of 48. And we were on Main Street originally, where all this painting was done, uh, where the Italian restaurant is today, the fancy restaurant. Uh, it used to be the taxi office, a five and dime, and Hastings Plumbing and Heating. Then we moved across the street where the doll shop is. And if you pass Main Street right now, you can still see Hastings Plumbing and Heating right through the paint. It's sort of whatever paint he put on there, God, that's many years ago. It penetrates whatever's there. But again, if you know, you could still see the name uh, hustle through. Why did people object to you using your own tape? Uh, there was something. There was a fry tag around during the war uh, that was not associated associated with us, but that is the reason we changed it, uh, definitely. Uh, we had quite a few, again, when I say, I mean, complaints like you can't conceive. It was very trying. Uh, and we had an old truck, uh, $145, you couldn't buy a truck. And the fellow that did the best for us was Bill Blasberg, the old Bill. We ordered the truck, $1,125. Uh, which was a tremendous amount of money at the time, uh, at least to us. And uh, uh, it took us a good few months to get, but we were able to get it. And uh, we tried bribing him, and he was got indignant. And uh, But again, he delivered. Uh, and Blasberg was an institution in those days, really. Uh, and we bought quite a few trucks through the years through Blasberg, so. Where, where were you working before you went into the Army? I was in the Anaconda, just prior to going so in. So you stayed in the Anaconda from the uh, time you were here? I stayed in the Anaconda for about 18 months. I wanted, as a, again, a pipe fitter and a plumber. But I was basically a plumber when I went in there, because I started very young. And... Uh, 
uh, I went from there right into service. And when I came back, I could have gone down in the Anaconda, but I went in business. So, uh, and it, you know, it's a fun, this building here, which we live in today, the fellow that used to live here was, uh, uh, God, I'm getting old. Anna, Harry, Harry, Harry. You would know his wife, I'm... Anna? Some mother say something I may regret. Harry was a chauffeur here for sure. And on the beginning of the war, uh, they used to have a Br Bruce the Body Fords here with the old, ch I don't know if it means anything to Spike, with a checkered had a run, a beautiful. Uh, the chauffeur was always in the open, mm -hmm. in the front, a little canvas top. And he was a chauffeur here for years, but then we went on to rationing. He got a gallon and a half of gas, so Shaw didn't need a chauffeur. So then Harry had to move from here, and he moved into the village, and he got a job as an oiler in the Anaconda. But he was a chauffeur here for a lifetime. Uh, but uh, I'm, a, I'm a scared to say exactly a dock, a dock, which is still there today, and it sits south of the Anaconda entrance, about two to three hundred feet down. Uh, the dayliner for years used to stop there, and they stopped in the late thirties more so that there weren't enough people using the accommodation. So you'd go to Yonkers or to 125th Street to get on a day liner. But anyway, the village of Hastings owned that particular dock and about a hundred foot right away from the railroad track smack into the river with riparian rights after that. Uh, at the beginning of the war for safety, Anaconda closed the area at the foot of the bridge on the south end, they put a large gate, which is there today. And at that time, Ana there was Anaconda, and it was the Hastings Paving Company, which I assume Anaconda purchased. Uh, when I say Hastings Paving, it was the Hastings Paving Block Company. They're the people that made octagon, rectangular, uh, any type of asphalt block, real fancy blocks. But in between the Hastings asphalt block company and Anaconda on the south end was a hundred foot right away which was owned by the village. After, uh, for safety they shut it off during the war. What do you mean for safety? Well, more so that it was a defense plant, so the terminology was we have to shut that whole south end off so it wasn't accessible for people and again there was nothing to do there outside of walk to the particular dock. But at the, on the beginning of the war, or at the beginning of the war, they built this big gate, which is there today, which shut off the south end. The north end, they had redone the north mill that was right on the beginning of the war, or short, shortly prior to the war, they started uh, refurbishing the north mill, which had been closed since World War I. So there was a, another gate on the north end, which was always open, and Anaconda used that as a shipping area. But the south end was closed. After the war, there was a lot of talk about opening the gate again, because Hastings owned 100 feet. And in the early 50s, and I stand to be corrected for a year or so, Anaconda was able to purchase this particular dock for ten thousand dollars from the village of Hastings and the village sold it and again at the time I thought it I didn't like the idea of selling it uh, a lot of people didn't but again there was very little resistance and it was sold Can you shoot? I may say the wrong thing that's uh, uh, <coughs> Uh, but anyhow, that uh, and that was the end of the dock. But if you go down there, and you can walk there now, uh, Spike, and you'll see that it's an elevated dock with cranks and everything on, all wood. So if you had a low tie, you could drop it. If it was a high tide, it would raise. And the boats used to stop there, pick people up. 
many times. But again, this is a, a bygone era. Uh, Were they worried about spies? Well, during the war, when the, when the war started, they built on each corner there were uh, turrets or towers, the same as a prison. And they had guards on those towers 24 hours a day. And again, they were rifled out and everything. And they were on this end, and they were on the far end, and a couple in the middle. And there were guards posted when you entered. They had a tremendous amount of police there during the war, tremendous. Because, again, they had, uh, like I say, over 3,000 employees, I think 3,800 employees. So, again, that wasn't there for the employees. Uh, uh, it was also for, uh, more so if someone came in there and tried to do something to blow up the plant or whatever you would assume they do in time of war. Did anyone ever try and break in? Or? No, not to my knowledge, no. What were they making their... <laughs> what were they? Strictly cable. They made endless types of cable. I can also say on the beginning of the war they made cable. And I gather that it was sent to Russia. And in those days it was a, quite a job to get it out to Murmansk. And I gather that at the time when it got there, they needed it in conflict. And everything shorted out. So there was quite a lawsuit on the beginning of the war against the Anaconda. And however the cable left this mill, and it wasn't... But again, most of their stuff was top-notch, uh, top-quality things that may have been, you know, just a bad mistake. But I know there was sort of a repercussion during the war. When I say during, it was on the beginning of the war. You know, maybe I'm taking a chance what I just said. You, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Well, uh, can you give a, dis a physical description of um, the waterfront at the t when you were employed by Anaconda? If you were to enter the Anaconda today on the south end, there's absolutely no physical difference on the exterior, on the water end of it. That's on the, what, they, what you would call the south mill. The only variation of the Anaconda property would be between what they call the machine hall, which is that red building you see here on the north end, and to that water tower on the south end. That's the only physical change. At that time, there was a big inlet in there, and Anaconda used that for rubbish burning, to uh, maybe burn the rubber off cable. Uh, in the process of making or manufacturing cable, there's a certain amount of waste, and when I say waste, things may not perform properly in the manufacturing, and there'd be a, you discard it, so it may have rubber on it, it may have uh, plastic, it may have tar, tape, paper, and they used to take it at that end between that water tower and what they call the machine hall, and uh, they'd burn a lot of their rubbish, which was allowable in, in, in that era. That was prior to the war and on the beginning of the war, which is the only thing I can reflect to. Uh, then, at the beginning, they started bringing in barges full of stone, and they projected out to where that machine hall is now, and going south to the uh, south to that water tower. And they built a wall which has to be in depth at least 35 feet, because it's very deep at that point, and they brought barge after barge. It took, I'm taking a guess, about a year to perform. And in the meantime, the rubbish started filling in, and the so-called inlet, or little crescent-shaped opening, disappeared. And today, it's a big parking lot. But that is the only physical change. Now, as you go north of the Anaconda, the only physical change there would be this projection out, which Tower Ridge uh, filled in with stone which came from Otis Elevator. 
but exclusive of that, there is no physical change on the river. As you go down to Zinzer on the south end, Zinzer looked the same 50 years ago as it does today, to my knowledge. Uh, the only difference would be today you have these big uh, uh, oil tanks, which at present isn't used, which is owned by Mobile, I guess. Uh, when, when they burned the rubber, did that create a big stink? I mean, where did it you know, to be honest with you, uh, Spike, uh, we lived in that era on Spring Street, which would be directly east of where they burned, and we never actually noticed it. It dissipated so well, and Anaconda, I have got to say, kept a well-restricted little fire there. It wasn't an excessive garbage burning. You could smell the Dobbs Ferry dump burn. You could, at that time, we used to burn on the south end in Hastings. The Hastings there was the Hastings dump. Now, for an example, if you go south of, uh, of Zinzas, I think uh, Hastings owns 22 acres in there. And again, I stand to be corrected. They owned it at that time. And they used to fill there for years. And at that particular dump, there was complaints because that was garbage and it has a different uh, aroma. Uh, you know, a lot of times some of these rubbers, they, they, they may be toxic and they may have strong odors, but sometimes it even has a little sweet odor about it. It was nothing that you would complain too much about because, again, they weren't burning rubbish or garbage. They were burning wood and manufacturing surplus. Again, it may, may have been toxic. God knows. I don't when you were working at Anaconda, was your job dangerous at all? Or? I don't. Anything, just relative to what you were doing. Uh, I was a basically a pipe fitter. I went there temporarily because, again, I've fitted pipe all my life. Uh, and uh, uh, no more dangerous than any place else. Were you ever injured on your job? Or? No, I was burnt once with a acetylene torch. Uh, and you know, it's a funny thing, uh, I go back, uh, uh, we lived at that time, we lived on Olinda Avenue, and I happened to be burned, and you know, maybe I shouldn't go into this, but again, I happened to, someone patted me on the back, and with dark glasses, I turned and said, what? And as I turned, the torch came this way, and I burnt my arm here, right through the glove, and again, it was quite a burn. Uh, and... Uh, Stupidity, that's what it derived from. And anyway, uh, I'm trying to think. Uh, Doc Jenks was a cr lived across the street from us. Does that mean anything to you? Doc Jenks, yeah. And he was quite a doctor. And anyway, Jenks uh, took care of it. Because <laughs> I, 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 yeah, I got pretty, got pretty bad blood poison. So then I had to go to Doc Johnson who also was next door to me to the left. Jenks was across the street, Johnson was next door. So, it's like Joe Aljo sent me in there. So, But anyhow, it got a little infected and uh, it cleared up. I never lost a day's work. I still want to work, but I should have it wrapped up fairly well. Did the company pay for that? Or did you oh, they uh, yes, they paid for everything. Uh, medically, they paid for whatever the medical costs were. It cost nothing. Uh, and, in fact, Doc John Johnson, who lived directly next door to us, we lived on 21 Olinda Avenue, uh, he was the Anaconda uh, doctor. He was, and in fact, I was more geared for Jenks because I knew Doc Jenks right across the street. It was easier to go to Jenks than uh, to him. Did you wear any special equipment when you were, you were talking about the gloves and stuff? Or did you wear special stuff when you were working? Or? Not really. No, no, no more. Well, again, like say, if you're using a torch of that nature, like what I happened to be doing at the time, uh, you would wear your normal protective gloves and the protective eye glasses. They're very dark. You can't see through them. Let's say if you turn away, you can, you can see the flame, but you can't see the face. So. And, uh, you know, it's a funny thing, from that day on, it, it taught me years later, many times you pat it on the back and someone says, hey, Paul, how about this? And it, it, it's an unconscious thing, so you would, go, you would go like that, and that's just the way it went. It just went boom, and what made it even worse, the glove was there, and the shirt was there. So first, uh, within that second, at 3,500 degrees, which is fairly hot on these torches, that's past the thing of the blowtorch. 
Uh, it burned the glove and it set the shirt on fire. And it scored. But again, the shirt and the glove protected the arm to a degree. But again, it was a pretty good burn. Uh, yeah. What shifts did you work on? I worked, uh, say at that time, uh, always from 8 to 4.30. That was being the daytime. But uh, with prior to the war, they had started an 8 to 6. So from 8 in the morning to 6 o'clock at night. This was five days a week. And on Saturday, we worked from 8 to 4.30. That's the way the shift was. But many a times in that process, uh, I was the only fitter in the North Mill. Uh, I had two helpers. I was pretty young at the time. Uh, I, at times, would go to work at 8 o'clock in the morning and not get home until 6 o'clock the following day. That's a fairly long shift, All right? Yeah, that's happened quite often. Number of times, yeah. So, right. Explain how it was. Well, again, it would be on different things. It was uh, like, uh, uh, I worked originally, when I worked with what constituted when I went down there, I was the pipe fitter. And I worked with what they call a foreman by the name of Bishop, Al Bishop. And he was a millwright foreman, so we were setting machines, these big rubber mills, they're fairly big mills. Uh, and they were brought down from Rhode Island, Port Tucket, Rhode Island. So uh, they had uh, specialists that more or less made sure they were set as to their direction. But by the same token, we set these mills up. And after I went on to put it cooling systems in and water, and then we set other equipment up, which were what they called tubers, like a big grinding machine that would grind meat. This would grind rubber, and it would uh, uh, I can't think of the name. But anyway, uh, the rubber would come out and a piece of raw copper would go through a guide and the rubber, the copper may be hypothetically an eighth of an inch in diameter and the female hole in the tuba would be a quarter of an inch. So it would put a sixteenth of an inch of rubber all around that piece of copper as it comes out centered. This was compressed, this hot rubber and it'll come right out on top of the wire. But anyway, uh, and that we used to put oil coolants on there. They'd use oil to cool because it doesn't vaporize. Oil will go to 350, 400 without vaporing, whereas water, and again, oil you can control fine and then you can water. But anyway, uh, this is what we did. Uh, and then from there, after these mills, and the, they had lead presses. We set lead presses up. This was all on the beginning of the war, short of the war, uh, and into the first six months of the, the war. And by that time, that mill was going full blast 24 hours a day. And there'd be certain major breakdowns, be it on steam, or it may be like a, I can't recall. On water, or some machine may physically falter and we'd have to run temporary lines in. Say if something broke bad, it's hard to, you know, you can lose like a cable or fly off and it'd do a heck of a lot of damage. Uh, and it may tear water pipes or steam lines out. And this is what would make the long hours, but it would be an emergency, yeah. But I did that quite often, when I say quite a number of times, but many times I'd go in and at six in the morning, I wouldn't get home till 12. And like I say, sometimes I go in six in the morning, stay all day, all night, all the next day, and then get home. Did but, you sleep there? Or? Oh, no, 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 no. Well, actually, actually, actually performed. Uh, this is a fact. Uh, over time, uh, uh, you know, when you relate to the money at the time, coming out of the Depression, uh, where a dollar went a long way, and if you had a basic pay of a dollar three to a dollar thirteen an hour just prior to the war, and if you can multiply the overtime 
and then there were certain additional compensations where money would double even a little further. It was pretty lucrative at the time. What, what kind of bonuses? I mean, no bonus, no. But actually, like for example, I can't recall exactly. Uh, I may even have. Oh. Hey, Anna. Else. Are you? Come here just for a second. Is uh, you know, not that I'm saying the wrong thing. Down the shop on the beginning of the war, I used to go. I happen to say sometimes I'd go in at eight o'clock in the morning. I wouldn't get home till the next night. Oh yes. There were a lot of yeah, times. The big thing was the first time he brought home a check for a hundred dollars. That was such a big one. You know what the time? You, unless you geared to it. Married, um, when my father, I mentioned it to my father, Paul. In those days, he asked permission, and Paul, he approved it, Paul. But I think he said. The only thing I ask, you must make forty dollars a week, so that you can, you can support a wife and a child. And in spite of the fact that well, we won't have any children, he said, or wife, he said, one never knows. You know. But that would be stipulated. But well, anyway, you, 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 if, you, if, you, if, if you hit it, if you hit over a, a hundred dollars on the end of a week. At that time, it was tremendous. Uh, and again, I used to hit way, way, way above that. That was way, way above average. But uh, and that, that didn't hold true for the uh, for the whole shop. See, if they were on an eight-hour day, Spike, in that case, they had three shifts, so you'd wind up eight, sixteen, twenty-four. Now, assuming that maybe in, in certain areas, uh, let's say, for an example, a certain piece of machinery would only have a requirement of 12 hours. So you wouldn't have two shifts on that. Maybe one would work 12 hours. But you see, they worked on bonuses down there. Say these fellows that worked on the machines themselves. If you could tickle it a little and get it to move fast, uh, they could produce a fair dollar during the war. But what was the toughest part of your job when you worked down there? You know what, Al? Lion, um, tough. You know when you look at that, you see that tower there, that water tank. See that water tank? That's pretty high. And uh, one day it has an overflow on it, and that was used for fire during the war for that north end. And all of a sudden, the water started running over the top, and I had to go up there to repair the ballcock. And there's a big valve in there. It's quite a valve. And I've been up there a number of times. But anyway, my first experience, as you go up that, it doesn't look like much. And a lot of times, you can go, go up. But God bless you. Watch out when you come down. But going up, how much can you carry if you go up a straight ladder that goes up like this, see, at that angle? Now, when you hit the bottom of the tank, it goes out this way, you see? So if you have two, three wrenches, a couple of pliers, a screw, couple of screwdrivers on you, in reality, your feet, gravity tells you it's straight down, so you can't go up at a diagonal area. Your feet want to hang out, so you sort of have to put them over and sort of pull yourself to it. But anyhow, <laughs> you get up there, and there's a little catwalk. I can see it right around, more so that I know what's there. Then there's another ladder going up with a cover. Then when you get up there, by the time you get there, you're half exhausted. That was a, I've gone up there, I, if I say four, half, at least a half, maybe ten times. But today, they wouldn't allow you to do that. See, today you'd have a cage around you. So again, you could lean back. You can go up there casually. But to go up one straight line this way, then go, it sort of bends out. You got to have to be out of your mind. But it was a different era. You, you question nothing. If it leaked, you went up and repaired it. Did the weather affect, uh, or the different seasons affect your work at all? Well, it was always worse in the winter. It's cold. Everything cold and it's freezing. Uh, many times I'd get home, let's say at 6 o'clock. And then maybe I'd get a call, 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock at night, that there's something, and it go down. Uh, and again, I'd have to run down. Uh, uh, and eight, nine out of ten times, it'd be a steam, something, a steam leak. Uh, and they carried a fair amount of steam, steam down there. So, 
but uh, nothing outside of it. It's miserable in the winter if you're working on coal pipe, no matter what it is. It's, uh, and again, I'm sort of a summer individual. I hate the winter, so I'm not a skier. Uh, and uh, But anyhow. Who are your co-workers there? Co-workers, I have to think. Uh, the, Mel Haynes, uh, who still lives in Hastings, that's young Mel, his father was Hast the old Hastings plumbing. That's a derivative of the name that we've used. Uh, and uh, But Mel worked in the South Mill, and he, he later became master plumber of uh, the Anaconda, of the whole Anaconda system. In fact, Mel and I went in service together, uh, but uh, we never, ever physically worked together. But I know him for three quarters of a lifetime. Uh, I'm trying to think of anyone uh, in uh, Hastings. Uh, I can't think of the name. Anna, what, what was by what was uh, Tony's name? Oh, Remember that used to work for me in the Anaconda. Tony, what? He lives on uh, Ravensdale Road. Ball-headed man today. Broken English line. That's not going through there, is it? Mike. No. Next to Capuano. And I can't. Yeah, I can't uh, think of uh, most of these names because I haven't seen them in 20, 30, 40 years. So. Were there any women that worked? There was a lot of women that were, uh, women worked what they call the braiding uh, machines. Uh, they're like weaving machines that would put a braid of cotton or nylon or a glass braid on the outside of wire. Uh, I don't think it's done today. On the south end, they had uh, uh, asbestos machines, quite a few asbestos machines, which they had, uh, people got pretty sick from this after the war, and there were certain compensations rendered by the anaconda uh, due to this. Uh, but uh, there were mostly men on the, what they call saturating and asbestos machines. And the braiding machines on the north end were all run by women. Uh, and I know the women, I can't think of their names. Uh, uh, I just can't. Were, were there any blacks that worked in anaconda? You know, you're asking a good question. The uh, I always remember the rod mill. This was an experience to watch the rod mill where they drew this red-hot copper. And there were, to my knowledge, a few black people in there. And these were big, strong, powerful individuals. And like people from Washington area, some of these older Russians that worked there, John Locke, these were all powerful men. And uh, th this red cable would come at you. And I mean come at you, Spike. You had to see it to believe it. And it is like this, and about that big, white hot. And they grabbed that with a tongue, a big long tongue from there to there. And they spun that around, and they just watched it as it spun around. They have protectors on their legs there, and they stuck it into a water-cooled roller. And the roller had like a lot of uh, uh, crescent rings, two crescents, two rollers, both crescents. Uh, sort of half moons on each one and if you hit you had a number of that you could hit mm -hmm. So if you got just close boom and it jump into one of those holes now when it jumped in it The wire was that big when it came out. It was this big So it went back and forth maybe about five or six different twirls And then it came out and white hot it went right into a metal roller and it reeled that whole bar up and a bar I think was 480 pounds I stand to be corrected there. And uh, that will have, you'd have a big maze now, a cable. Now they would take it from that point, when it was still white hot, take it up in the air and dip it in cold water, take it across the vat and drop it into cold water, take it out of the cold water and move it ahead a little and dip it into a big acid tub. Uh, because when they dipped it in cold water, it would turn black. When they placed it in the acid tub, it had turned perfect copper the way you would see at home. 
then they dip it once more in water to remove the acid and then it was sent to the end where it would go into different parts of the mill to be fabricated in different manner uh, in different ways but they, again they, they would take this wire and god there was many methods of stretching it fivefold they used to uh, in some areas they'd take that little piece of wire and it'd be so fine that you couldn't even see it you couldn't see it for fine instruments and they'd be uh, they may take something a half inch in the diameter and they keep taking it through a lot of wheels and each wheel would rotate a little faster than the past wheel and that would stretch it each time a little more so it'll go in a half inch and it may come out a sixteenth or a sixty-fourth or a hundred and twenty-eighth uh, but again it would but outside of that was there any socializing between uh, the different minority groups, between blacks and whites, between the women and people that were working? I don't think you had time to socialize. It was a different era. Uh, came Christmas, the general practice was that you'd either get a ham or a turkey at Christmas time. This was sort of a general practice in the Anaconda. And the fellow that always supplied the turkeys to the hams was Al Spiegel, Spiegel's Market, Al's Market. But, uh, and again, it was a heck of a lot of turkeys or a heck of a lot of hams. Uh, and uh, I don't recall of any type of party that was ever held. They had a Navy E right on the beginning of the war that the plant received the Navy E. This was to give you an extra little inspiration to make the wire faster, I guess. I stand to be corrected now. You know, you think back and it, you, you could, I may joke or laugh about it. But uh, they did get this early Navy E, because most of their, whatever they were producing, I gather, went for the Navy. Uh, but uh, socializing, I may not be that good. And it did, was there any socializing in the Anaconda? I shouldn't keep it. Outside of the general. You know, not to be crude. The only social life I remember, all the women all used to wear jackets. And they were always in snoots. You know, snoot that held their hair so it wouldn't get caught. Caught in the machine. And they would get off at teeth in the morning. And the diamonds are Jack. Yeah, the thankies. And the girl would take out six jobs. So forth. <laughs> yeah, but... And as I say, I don't mean to be ghost, but I don't remember. The number one, there wasn't time for dancing. That's what I'm saying. No, but there wasn't this. Uh, Would you, do you, what do you think of the working conditions in Anaconda? At the time of the, on the beginning of the war, I honestly felt the working conditions were very fair. And I wouldn't consider myself a barometer on the conditions, basically, that I had come from a depression area shop where every week there was someone looking for your job. And the Anaconda was much easier to work for 
than it was working for private enterprise on the outside, reflecting to smaller businesses. Mm -hmm. The demanding, the smaller shop is far more demanding than a major corporation of this type. A lot of times a small shop pays more than a big major industry, but I didn't find anything wrong with the working conditions. What was the route you took to get to work? I always walked. If I, I lived on, on Olinda, 21 Olinda Avenue, I just walked down Olinda onto Broadway, down Main Street, and I always used to enter on the north end, uh, in the north mill end, because that's where I was employed. Uh, if I worked in the south mill, I worked in the south mill for about two months, and then I'd walk down Washington Avenue. I never enjoyed that. Not Washington Avenue. There was something when you crossed the bridge into the Anaconda, it had a very cold feeling. And if you came into the north end, it was open, it was bright, it was airy, you could see the palisades, there was everything. It just had a better feeling. Uh, you sort of went to work with a, at least I went to work with a better stride than when I worked in the south mill. And Frank, I didn't like the south mill at all. I didn't like the rod mill. Uh, rod mill it would be like, say, if it's snowing, it would be like being out here just with a, a little roof on you, very drafty, because the whole thing is totally open. Awful, awful place to work. Did you ever make any stops on your way down to get something to eat or coffee or donut or anything? I used to stop at Zanke's Diner, which is where Aloisio is today, uh, where the uh, Rusa store only was half the size at the time, a third of the size. And right where his main showroom is, this display room on the north end, there used to be a, a diner in there, and it was owned by a fellow by the name of Kurt Zanke. He owned that during the war. The fellow that owned it prior to him was Jack Butterfield. He owned the Hastings Diner, and he owned the diner in Dobbs Ferry, where Otero is today. Otero worked for Jack Butterfield. Then he bought that from Jack, to my knowledge, and Zanke bought this one from Butterfield. This was all before the war. But I'd stop in there for breakfast occasionally. And what always surprised me, a fellow by the name of Eng uh, bought coffee twice for me. And he was the general vice president of the all Anaconda systems. And it was, uh, I never got over that. Uh, uh, that he... Someone had said, there's one of the Anaconda boys, so he bought, he bought breakfast. Must have been about eight of us in there. And it had to be around 7.15 right in there, but he was early. And a very outstanding individual. He had to be about 6.6. Six, six. Uh, and if he can sh shut that off, I can tell you another thing. Yeah. So did, did you meet people at uh, the, the restaurant? For breakfast, I mean, was that sort of an, a pre-planned thing, or did no, people no, just have no? No, no, I just occasionally, uh, Spike. I would occasionally stop in there. That uh, you know, I'm trying to think. When I yes, I would stop in there practically every morning. Now that I think it, not to me, it was more so to have breakfast. Uh, I was married, and I got up a little earlier, and I'd have breakfast there instead of having it home. And what constituted breakfast may have been a, uh, a hard roll and coffee. Uh, maybe splurge for an orange juice occasionally, but uh, again, this would be the normal sort of a thing. And I carried my lunch to work, so... Uh, I ate down below because you only had a half hour for lunch. Uh, but again, it was nothing, uh, not uh, a specific meeting spot to me. It was more so, gee, I'll have a cup of coffee and a roll for breakfast before I go to work, period. And after work, did you... Did you I never stopped any, but I went directly home. Uh, I used to go, when I lived on Olinda Avenue, I'd stop on Spring Street by my mother-in-law, and I'd have dinner there. Uh, and... Uh, that would be volunteers, and uh, then I, uh, a lot of times I'd even wash there, and then uh, stay there for the evening, or, and, and then go home clean. Uh, I, I always had extra pants and shirts down below, 
so I could even change to a, a pair of pants. And I'd wash down below now that I think, even before I came up, but I would bathe when I'd get home, so... Uh, did the unions play a uh, role in, in uh, working at Anaconda? Or? Yes, it was a union shop. They paid a, they played a role, and I don't feel that I, I actually know if it was good, bad, or indifferent. Because at the time it was, uh, it was union, but I don't think it was powerful. Or it wasn't uh, as we know of unions after the war in the 50s. Uh, we, uh, in business, had quite a bit of union problems uh, for the first 10, 15 years in business. But uh, as far as down the Anaconda, we paid a union due. And uh, I can't remember if the company removed the due or if we paid it to maybe a delegate. A delegate, or uh, and there was occasionally there may be something with seniority that would come up, but there was very, very little action that I actually noticed. Now, say in the mechanical end where we worked through the machine shop, uh, the North Mill didn't have too many people involved there. I can't remember how many. It had to be. 25, it must have been. Uh, but we never, ever had any union problem in our own immediate area. Uh, when uh, you were living on Olinda, was, was that in a house or apartment? Or? No, it was a house. And who lived there with you? Anna. Uh -huh. no, you no, 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 I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I thought you called me. No. Uh, it was two family. And we lived on the second floor. The fellow that lived downstairs was a fellow by the name of Jerry Ma. And uh, Jerry Ma worked for the Anaconda. He just, he even worked, Anaconda closed in 75. Uh, Jerry Ma worked in the Anaconda yet, I think three or four years ago yet, as uh, prior to their sale to this individual company that's down here now. And he stayed as sort of a watchman, uh, keep out of trouble. His daughter lives locally in Hastings. Uh, and Amar's father was, was he the postmaster? He may have been the postmaster, his father, but we had Amar, some sort of relation to Jerry. But again, it was a two-family house, and uh, during the war, Anna had to move because we were rent renting, and people by the name of Pegas bought the building. The building was offered to us at a ridiculous sum by Mary Murphy, who was in the real estate business in Hastings, and they were called the Three Irish Potatoes. It was her, her sister, and her father. And her father, Murphy, was uh, the village uh, uh, clerk for years. Uh, this was prior to our management system, uh, which we have today. But uh, Mary happened to come one evening, and when she sat on our porch, she lived right around the corner on Broadway, and she offered us 21 Olinda Avenue, for the tremendous sum of nothing down, solely pay the $35 a month uh, for uh, for the mortgage, and the cost of the house was $4,000. And uh, being frightened, I knew that I would be leaving shortly for service. Uh, it was too great a burden. Uh, and I think it was sold after the war for maybe no more than a thousand dollars more. Uh, but I think you could have bought half the half a Hastings for five thousand a piece and have a chain. So. Where, where, then where did you move to? Uh, well, uh, when uh, I was in the Pacific, uh, Anna had to move when they sold it. It was sold it, during the war. I forget what year. May have been forty. 44 right in there uh, could have been 45 uh, but Anna moved down in uh, the Roback building uh, the Roback building uh, you know where that is uh, Mike Cup, uh, I can't think of his last name the contractor has the building now it used to be Ostax 
Uh, and uh, we, uh, Anna moved in there because there was no empties on Spring Street. And on returning, we bought our first building, which was 5 Spring Street, which we still own today. So, But, uh, yeah, that 4000 seemed like a lot of money. <laughs> Who were your neighbors when you were living on Olinda? Doc Johnson was to the left on Broadway. It was kids, K-I-double-D, I think it was called, was right behind us. Uh, geez, I'm trying to think. Uh, I'm so bad at names. Was there an ethnic mix? Oh, yes. Jacobson lived right across the street from uh, Doc Jacobson. Well, wow, he used to drive me down into the village so many times uh, uh, in the morning. He used to be an early riser. He always used to get a shave at around 7.30, so every day, six days a week. It's certainly like Al Spiegel always got a shave. Uh, they were very good friends of my father was. And uh, uh, the Kaufmans weren't there anymore. They had lost the buildings. Uh, I can't think of the name. And right next door is an attorney teach. She's still there. Anna would know the name. I can't even think of it anymore. Did, did you socialize with those people? Or? Ah. We had Don Grant on the end of the block that was the dancing school. Uh, yes. To a degree, uh, more, I, you know, you ask a question, it's hard to, see, I left there when I went in service. Now, we didn't move back to Hopke Avenue until 1954, so there's a fair gap there. Don Grant was still there. Jacobson has moved over to uh, uh, Elm Place, uh, and uh, I'm trying to think. Uh, Socially, uh, was there a meeting place in that area that people would go to on the weekends or anything? Not really, not really. Uh, you'd be acquainted with the navy. You may go to dinner occasionally. You may have a yard party. Later on, I know we had crab parties up on Olinda Avenue. We even had block parties in 1955, 56. But that's sort of a bygone thing. Uh, we used to have dances. Now that I think of it down uh, in the Anaconda parking lot, where the Anaconda parking lot is today. When I say Anaconda parking lot, which is the village parking lot today, but that was just an open place that didn't have any uh, meters in it. It was just like a big macadam, macadam area. And uh, after the war, they had like bands and locally, we had some real good bands, uh, surprising. Like that firing it in every single Saturday night, that thing popped when someone was getting married. And they always had a good six-piece orchestra. And if you say ethnic, uh, 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 there was nothing but polkas. And uh, uh, again, uh, and if it was a, had a, 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 a Russian twing to it, some girl would be spinning low. And again, if it was Polish, it'd be a fast uh, hop. Uh, if it was German, something on that order. Again, on the uh, going down where uh, where Paul Perrin's office is today, before the war, that was the uh, Hungarian club. Uh, that was before the war, sure, because we held our reception in that particular thing when we got married, and that was 1941. Uh, and uh, outside, but anyhow, down below, on they used to have, on maybe on a Saturday night, they'd have an orchestra there, and God, they'd go right into 12, 1, 2 o'clock for more. the orchestra? You know, to be honest, I can't remember, Spike. I think the village was instrumental in that. And you know, in that day, if you, give, if you got six fellows together to play, or if you got seven or eight, it cost you either 30 or 40 bucks for the whole orchestra uh, and uh, but uh, oh, there's a man that's living mm -hmm. 
was your life centered in one area of the village, or was it diversifying? I would say it was diversified. Uh, um, more so due to business. Uh, I knew a greater area of people. Uh, uh, excuse me. Uh, a more diversified uh, a group of individuals. Uh, I had more friends out of the village than in the village, although I had our local friends there, no question about it. I could rattle like Dorsey's and Bularoski next door, which is the Café de la Gare. Uh, but uh, outside of that, I oh, definitely we had more outside than inside when I say uh, different people. Did, where did you shop? Where we always, uh, due to friendship, Al Spiegel was a very good friend of my father-in-law, and uh, they became acquainted up in Connecticut when he came in from, uh, from Hungary, Al, years ago. And this goes back again to about 1905 and 1906. So when they came to Hastings, all of a sudden, ten years later, my father-in-law sees that, gee, Al's got a butcher shop across the bridge. That was before he moved to where uh, this prime meats are today. But anyhow, as to where we shop, Al's, at that era, was where prime meat is today. And again, he had everything from soup to nuts, and he delivered. This was a great asset. Uh, so he always delivered to my father-in-law, mother-in-law. And uh, when we lived on uh, Spring Street, why, if they delivered downstairs, it was simple enough to drop two bags, which went upstairs. And when we moved to Hopke Avenue, we always bought from Spiegel. And the day he stopped delivering for some re reason, and see, this goes prior to supermarkets. The only super, we had no supermarket in Hastings. So if you had to go to a supermarket, you'd have to go to Dobbs Ferry, and it was a small A&P, which is H&S today. Uh, so the answer was, if you had Spiegel, and uh, in the same era as Al Spiegel, uh, we had Peel's Bakery. Peel's would deliver three rolls in the morning for a nickel. How could you go wrong? A ten cents delivery, you, you had a half a dozen, uh, uh, what they call Kaiser rolls, or Vienna rolls, whatever you want to call them. Uh, it's a bygone era, but anyway, when Al discontinued delivering, uh, we Anna bought for years from Bill Mandrick uh, on Washington Avenue, and uh, uh, when we, and I guess the last twenty some odd years, Anna goes to the supermarket. <laughs> you had talked about. Um sort of the different attitude between the people up on the hill and the people below the hill. Were there any other divisions in Hastings as far as attitudes of one group of people towards another? You know, to be truthful, I've never had that much of a problem, but... Uh, There were little ethnic differences that uh, there's always something. There were problems. I think there were. I know there were problems. Uh, I never, maybe I never had the time to get involved with these things. Uh, uh, and I could answer you this far better than I can, but I do know there was positively uh, little problems there. I, uh, and, you know, to me, it's like everything. There's a financial snob, there's an educational snob, if I'm using the right terminology. Everyone has a different concept. Everyone has a different... You, 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 I place you at sort of an individual that's more fair than a lot of people that I know. And, now, I say this to you sincerely, uh, Spike, uh, 
But again, there's always these little things. Uh, you know, a lot of times you don't notice it in parents, but you can pick it up in a child, and a child will capitalize even though you don't. Uh, you can sense, at least I can sense these things. You know, if you like the, you know, the best example for uh, I have, I can tell by that dog. <laughs> We've always had animals, so, uh, but which you don't know if you like them, if you don't, but uh, there's certain, certain things, so, but anyhow. And I could tell you more on that than I can. What, what do people in the community at large think of the waterfront workers? Waterfront workers. Annie, you know what I, Mike asked me before? Yeah. Were there any ethnic feelings between, you know, like Hungarians, Russians, Ukrainians? Uh, no, the only resentment there was. Was money? It, no, if you were not Irish. Did your children go to the Hastings schools? Uh huh. Well, Hastings Public. Right. And what were the names? What are the names of your kids? Nancy, Jean, and Bonnie Jean. Were you happy with the school system? Yes, I thought it was better then than it is now. I'm not authority on it today. Are you a member of any church in the town? Yes, uh, we belong to the Lutheran Church. Uh, my basic family background is, uh, uh, I hope we can't sing. Eh, come to me, yeah, this is stupid. Did they ever hold services near the waterfront? Not to my knowledge, no one ever has. Not to my knowledge. Outside of Moon today up in uh, Tarry, they, they hold it there every Sunday morning, 7 o'clock. They're there bright and early because I passed there. Did your church have one particular ethnic group that belonged to it? Was to be truthful, uh, the Lutheran church was basically German, which was no reason as to why we went. We just went basically because it was a Lutheran church. My background is Episcopalian. Uh, my daughter Bonnie goes to the Episcopalian Church in Irvington today. But uh, I'm not a strong churchgoer. Uh, but we belong to it. I'm, I'm a Mason since 1946. I belong to the Masonic uh, order, so, which has no bearing on church. Right? But, uh, We're... Did it serve a social function also when you first started going or not? Yes, it did, but I'm not that socially inclined. Uh, Masons was more of a social order. Were you involved in any sports teams, local athletic teams? Or? Not really. Where was your favorite place for socializing, for talking or eating or drinking? Or... Oh, God. You know, you know we always used to go over to uh, Delmonico's, which was one of our favorite restaurants on 119, which isn't there anymore. We went there for years. And we used to go into the courthouse restaurant in White Plains in the court square. And Lamondas, we went to Lamondas for the last 45 years. Uh, that's also on 119. And Bully Boy, does that strike a note to you? Uh, across the river, Bully Boy. Uh, we used to go to Bully Boys for years, and today we find it a little excessive. Uh, and. Uh, we used to go there when it only had four tables. 
today has 140. And the same things happened to Traveler's Rest. We used to go to Traveler's Rest on 100. And we used to go there prior to the war in the 30s. And it was called the Hamburger, the hamburger Joint. But again, it was great. And uh, uh, also today, I don't find it what it used to be. Were there any places in Hastings? In Hastings, uh, we used to go to what they call parties. And parties is where the, what do they call it, the Rock House on Soma River Road? Uh, today it's a union hall. There used to be, uh, and that used to be our favorite spot as far as Hastings, they always used to sell one-foot hot dogs, and you could measure them. They were 12 and a half inches, never, always 12 inches long. And they were a quarter, you couldn't go wrong. And they had a little Nickelodeon in it, I'm going before the war now, and, and after the war. Anna, what's the name of, of the favorite spot? Which, Anna, what, uh, parties, we used to go over the parties, on yes, what restaurant? You know, we we used to go with the parties. They had the one foot hot dogs, and then the where we used to go with Artie the most used to be up in uh, Ardsley. That was the old uh, the what 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 they call it log cabin. The igloo used to be right on the corner of Davis Ferry Road. Isn't that was that? Bands B A N S. Am I saying it right? Possibly yes. And that was bands, which, you know, Lucian's, Lucian Caldera? I don't think so. That very nice four, five-family house across the bridge. If you go to the south, the last house on the right-hand side is a red brick building. It was, was owned by Lucian Caldera. Lucian bought that around 1950, I'd say. Now, he bought that from Metz Walsh. And Metz Walsh bought it from bands. What era are we talking about? Where did we go? Did we go to any restaurant in there Hastings? Were no there was when, really nothing here. When, when one wanted to make, uh, not an impression even, but if you had a client, Mary Murphy, to take someone out to dinner, you always went on the Bronx River Parkway to Randall Brooker. Yeah, I know. I'm trying to think. If that was the. 48 spike. Layton's got a quarter for a cup of coffee. That was a lot of money at that well, time. Six of us went in and split a sandwich for what was Well, we went in there. There was eight of us. There was eight of us we went in there. Well, I can tell you who it was. Well, don't tell me. Okay. Okay. But anyway, it was some of your cheap relations. But it was $2 or something, the sandwich. We had a little of sandwich. It was two bucks. And uh, I forget, we uh, had a, a bottle of beer, they had no tap beer, and we were going again to the log cabin, and the log cabin was closed. And that waitress and maitre d' was so nasty, that's the reason we bought that sandwich, and we split the sandwich amongst the crew of us, and we had maybe six or eight bottles of beer, whatever it was, just one round. Uh, one did not, that was an era where one did not go out. Sort of, on the water there was fishing and you did some swimming. Were there any uh, other kinds of activities that were done on, in the water? Not that, to my knowledge, outside of commercial Pops, fishing. commercial fishing was where the, uh, tennis courts are today was Pop's commercial fishery and he kept his uh, shared nets right across the way and that was there for years until the storm knocked uh, that, outside of that thing, to yeah. my knowledge there was Did nothing. Did you ever picnic there? We never, pic we never picnicked on the river. One never really picnicked on the river. The only ones who ever went down to the river were the kids. Were the kids. Kids who are the were, biggest uh, um, user of the, of the river. You know, what they, what they call the water rats. Yeah. And they were the ones who lived across the bridge for... Yeah. Uh, there were more and the local village children use this river, even today, right now. You can come down... 
well, not, not this year, not as, each year has been less, although it goes, it used to go like this, see? Then it got a little lower. Mm -hmm. See, then it may jump up a little and then go down. But right now, in the last two weeks, must have been 50 different people down here fishing, Anna. Ask Irene. Right down here in the same spot they sit here. Yeah. Do, does the river change with the seasons? You notice that it changes? What, when you say change, in what respect? What? In any way. I mean, is there... Not really. The only change there is with the seasons is um, the boats. It's the only thing that one can There's notice. just more boats um, now. That years ago, they used to let it freeze over. And, but the Coast Guard now keeps the channel clear and they break up the ice. But the only difference one can see is in the um, in the, in the boating, right? For right. the pleasure boats, yeah. um, the day liner. Uh, today I noticed that one up again, and it goes at ten now. For it did go up. Yeah. Uh, they discontinued the day liner. They say it just didn't pay. Mm -hmm. And but I noticed that there is a maybe it's a smaller boat, maybe it's a circle line boat. I haven't read it. Oh, a white one. Uh, I seen it the other day. Boat. Yeah. That's still the day line, Arena. That's I don't yeah. Know. Okay. Uh, you had talked about wolves being very special. I beg your pardon. Who? Wolves. Wolves, Paul Dunn. Oh, wolves. Yeah, Dunn's, Yeah. Uh, how is it special? Because you, you mentioned that when you would bump into people and they'd say you're from Hastings, you know. Well, uh, what made it special was it had a nickel beer, and it drew the young kids. And the young, well, again, I don't because question there wasn't that. Much money for it. No. And if you can go out Friday nights, particularly, uh, they had nickel beer and they had steam plants like you would not believe. And so, really, for a couple of books, you could bring your kids, where well, they used to leave them in the car, right? There. Well, to me, my recollection of Wolf would be three and four deep in the bar that you couldn't even get your hand in to get a beer, three and four bartenders in the back. Have you ever, you've been in there on, on, uh, this with is Blanches. Blanches, Blanches, right? Food before. Okay. Mm -hmm. you've, you see how big it's in the back. There were nothing but tables in there. When you looked in the back, it was loaded. You couldn't even move. You had to squeeze your way through the door. Uh, it would be like Club 54 today, you know, some of these mm -hmm. big, and again, you can't even move in there. And the, you had, the beers were like the stein, it was the glass, it wasn't the, Fancy glass. It was what a dubious distinction, you know, that this was is the, what Hastings I would was say, for. But nevertheless, this is what people identified. And as Paul said when he was in the service, if he mentioned Hastings and if there was anyone kind of in a 25 mile radius in that day, they can always say, oh, yes, we know. And I think the nicest gin mill in Hastings was Polly's on Washington Avenue and Warburton Avenue, where the uh, Getty Station is today. They had a porch that wrapped around the whole building, and it had one of these Russian Orthodox Church uh, tops. And the bar was tremendous. And when you walked in, it had the double swinging doors. You know, it had what a bar looked like. Maker bar. The, yeah, a, 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 a shot and a beer. Uh, and there were three different gin mills like that in Westchester at the time. The one was where the on Soma River Road in Elmsford. And the other one was on 233rd Street. Uh, and uh, they were all on the same order where they had these wraparound porches. And in the summer, they, you could go out there and have a beer. And, uh, but anyway, uh, yeah, that's all I can... Did different ethnic groups go to the bars, or were they, was, did each bar have its own ethnic group? I think that the Russians... Uh, the Russians and, stayed over by police by and down by the first... Do you know what it today is Dorsey, the first uh, saloon that you come up from the railroad station? That's Dorsey's. Uh, that was owned by uh, Ignaz. Ignaz. Yeah. That was, and Paul, it was only the Polish or the Russian that went in there. That's so right. Where did the Irish Wolves, go? Wolves, went the to Wolves. Wolves. They wolves. went to Wolves. Yeah. Who went to Wolves then? The, the Irish. Irish. Yeah, it was more of an Irish. But were there other groups or just basically the Irish? That's what it is. Well, That's it was, it was uh, predominantly was. Irish, I would say. Uh, uh, there may... Between, Paul. No. You know, English may yeah. have but that's what it was. Yeah. The same as in Dobbs Ferry. Yeah. See, see, like, Wolf's catered to the younger kids, whereas Dorsey's didn't cater 
were ignorant, didn't cater to the younger kids. Bularoskis didn't cater to the young people. Am I saying it right? No. no. They never did. What do you say, young people? Well, Wolf had a younger crowd at it than anybody. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. But there's nothing like that around here anymore. Uh, up in Tarrytown, there was another, I can't even think of the name. That's the one on Main Street. Yeah. And again, this was one of these four or five man deep bars. You don't see this anymore today. You, you know, just don't. I do uh, say ethnic groups. <laughs> When I came to Hastings in 1929, we speak of ethnic. There were only five Jewish families. And you can and, rattle them off. Yeah, and that was yeah. it. And they were um, they were the, the dentist and... Uh, Jerry Finkelstein? Yeah. He was the dentist. Yeah. Before, and then there was the... Uh, Kaufman Brothers? Yes, uh, but uh, they had the um, Farragut Inn. Spiegel? And then... Um, Spiegel, he had the grocery store, and then uh, Jacobson had the drugstore. Yeah. There was one, and Calendars had the station. Calendars has it, yeah. There was one non-business family, and they were the Callenbachs. Callenbachs. Dorothy and Stanley, the boys, yeah. uh, that yeah. went to school yeah. with them, and they lived on the hill. And Spike, they associated, everyone went to school together, everything was fine, and when they became 16, the children, then the young men and all would go to the Hebrew Center in Yonkers, and there you met young ladies or whatever of your own faith. But at that time, there were only five, six families. Then you you, you could you could go to Heisers, ten maybe. Your small houses. Small houses had the gas station next to the fire firehouse where the movies. And he was a jeweler, but had turned had to go into the gas station business because there was no money during the Depression for jewelry. And the small houses were two, the loveliest small people, and you know, about well, five foot tall. had gone to Savannah, that we noticed there was a large Jewish element in Savannah. And we always went to a Jewish Greek restaurant yeah. there every time we went through. And it was quite a rough. For years we went there, yeah. And largest Jewish population, and the small houses were from Savannah. Savannah. And I swear That's the reason we... Uh, blood someplace along the line, right? Oh, uh, yeah. They were lovely people, but you know, way in the... And the children are down there. Some of, there's children in, in Savannah, yeah. And daughter, yeah. Ruth, she married quite a, um, a man who, apparently, very comfortably, uh, he had supermarkets there, but that's where Ruth yeah. is. But they were... Everyone... These Jewish people were lovely, lovely people. Mrs. Callender, when they had their stationery store, um, and um, Caruso has it now, Mrs. Callender always dressed so well, didn't she? No question about it. And with the apron, and the Ben was the same way with a tie. You don't need this. But again, it was a, again, it was and, in a country uh, by. They had a business second to and none. And children, yeah. all the Jewish people raised their children in carriages in front of the store here. Because this is the way that was, uh, it was. Oh, again, uh, and again, what did we do? We sat on Spring Street. Uh, turned out. You know, I'm just thinking now that years ago, in the summer, and it just like stuck a note when Anna said, uh, uh, across the street from us was a store, and the fellow that rented the store was Dick Archer. Am I saying? Okay, this is, this is, yeah, he's a character. Yeah, now, you know, you hit a character which we don't have anymore. Now, Dick Archer... I'm going back into the 46, 7, 8, up to 1950. Now, on the bottom of the hill, we had another girl by the name of Mabel. And everybody used to say, what's in the bag, Mabel? Shit. Mabel, you know the Lafergie, Lafergie Avenue? Lafergie Avenue. Mm -hmm. She's the, the descendant of the... Mm -hmm. Five corners there. Mabel, 
was, I don't know how, but that's who she's a descendant of, of the Lepergies. There was money, but she was a little... Nuts. A little, you know, not playing with not, full deck. Al Spiegel... Well, you, yeah, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, but okay. Uh, uh, let me finish uh, this. But Dick Archie used to be across the way, and we used to sit on the curb on a hot summer's day, and Dick had come out, and he'd have a big tub of water, like, you know, the what you, the old galvanized tub? Yeah. He's soaking his feet across the street. Now, mind you, now, this is a different era now. The train would pull in at a quarter to five. Five taxis used to go down for each train spike to meet the people. Of course, your quarter to go to the top of the hill. And it was a different type of clientele. They were driven up. They were picked up in the morning. Those taxis went up and down. It was Brennan's taxi service around Main Street. Dick would be there, and people would walk, Hi, Dick. And he'd be soaking his feet. And he used to repair fishing poles. And he'd be putting the string on and putting the shellac on. And he'd sometimes have 20, 30 old fishing poles standing that he's working on. And I, you got to be careful to cut this out. But then Mabel, some nights we'd be sitting there. And they'd come on, Dick, Dickie, let me in. Tonight's a nice night. Can't we get together? Dickie, come on. Oh, my feet hurt. i got to soak my feet, Mabel. Don't bother me. <laughs> this would be going on right in the middle of the street, 7, 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock at night. But again, it, I can't tell you. We had maybe a half a dozen, eight or ten of these. Uh, another thing that is gone today, when you reflect the ethnic, where the park is today, the entrance to the library, say right off uh, Maple Avenue, there used to be like... Julie Chemka, you know Julie, the mayor, Julie? Well, his father was very tall. You could always see him. He had to be about 6'6". Six, six. But he and a whole crew of cohorts, about eight or nine of them, always there on the corner there, always speaking Russian. And sometimes they'd cross the street. You, you could almost clock it, but there'd be six or eight of them every day. Or if they pass the shop by us on Dock Street, all up, Polly, all up, and then... Uh, and uh, there used to be a father named Course Jack. Again, comes into character. He'd buy a pack of cigarettes, and he'd always buy pell mell. And they'd buy a good cigarette. And he cuts them in half and put it in that old Roosevelt lighter. You know, again, these are characters. It, we don't have this anymore. Uh, but that used to be a particular crew, and they were mostly Russians and Ukrainians. But they were like. A crew of young guys, uh, and they'd be, and man, you'd see them laugh, and they're unreal, but there's nothing in that left anymore. It's a good few years, uh, but uh, I don't know. Did, did the McCarthy period affect you in your work at all? Not really, not to my knowledge. Was there anything in the, did it affect the village? Now, to be honest, uh, I'm basically Republican. I realize you're a Democrat. Uh, uh, it never affected me. Uh, you know, it's a funny thing. Being a, uh, basically a political family background, even from my father's side and my father-in-law's side, my father-in-law always used to say, God only knows which leave you pull when you get into the box. Uh, won't you pull what you feel is right? Uh, but, uh, and my parents were all Democrats. You couldn't even mention Republican. But I do know that I don't think in his lifetime he ever voted a straight ticket. So, uh, so he always evaluated everything individually. Uh, and I do know Anna's father was the same way. So, but uh, McCarthy, no. Uh, uh, I never cared for the individual as a, a, an individual. I'm may be prejudiced in certain ways. Everyone has some little uh, form of prejudice in them. But I could not stand the man. I dislike when someone uh, doesn't give you the opportunity to answer that you're being bullied. He, to me, he was a bully, uh, disregarding of whatever he thought. Uh, I'm as anti-communist as God made him. Uh, uh, but uh, McCarthy, no, uh, he's just 
just something about them. I don't know what the hell it is. Uh, I can uh, I can look at people and not like them, which is terrible. Uh, you know what I'm saying. Uh, but anyway. Uh, Did you ever go to the movies here in town? In town? Oh, yes, we went in town. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, see, the Hastings movies was closed for many years. And in 1940. Six on the beginning of 1946, they reopened it and they put eighty-five thousand dollars into it, which was a tremendous amount of money. The movie opened in 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 in, in eighty. We used to go. Even your father, uh, you and I, used to go, right, Anna, into the Hastings movie. Yeah, until. Uh... Well, I know the alteration was eighty-five. That was 1946. I know who did oh, well, it. Salzman yeah, did yeah, that. Yeah. So, but the thing is, we. Yeah, we went to the movies, I can remember, how long, to the 50s? Into the 50s, yeah, if we went, that would be after the 50s. But like I say, before the war, we used to go to the movies in Dobbs Ferry, and we used to walk to Dobbs Ferry. In and that era, people used to go, like us, ordinary people, uh, without any kind of You went to the movies twice a week. Sunday night was the big movie night, Saturday night was kind of Necker's night, right? <laughs> I guess so. You know, the young people, but on Sunday, people used to go to the movies, and then you went midweek when it changed, when the films changed. Yeah, usually Thursday, uh, Friday, Saturday and Sunday, and then Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, something like yeah, that. Yeah, whatever it was. But we used to go to the Hastings movies, uh, the, and it was renovated in 1946. And I know we did the work there. We did the heating and the... And then there was the one ice cream parlor that was... Really Brunings, that was next door. Yeah, that was excellent. With a cup and saucer. But that was a real old-fashioned ice cream parlor. Everybody went to the ice cream parlor, and that was the big thing. Everybody, uh, the young girls, they went there to sneak smokes in the back. Yeah, and they had the marble tables in the back, and the other good ice cream parlor was Bartels and Dobbs Ferry. They were both great, and uh, but well, Bruning. Claim to fame, every spring he had or summer he had cantaloupe ice cream. And it was fantastic. Oh, and he made all his own candy. And when you went, it was excellent. Time, yeah. Uh, yes, oh. all the bowls, and you know, yeah, he used to get sixty cents for a quart of ice cream, and a man, you, you, you had to have a push cart to take it home. It was that heavy. The only one that had good ice cream was Joe Aljo, the, pharma the pharmacist. He had Borden's, and that was excellent ice cream in those eras. And uh, Gus Bruning, he always had uh, cheap cherries. <laughs> he, the cherries. <laughs> but, yeah, yeah, they weren't a good cherry, either, yeah. But again, I know for years. But anyway, but he, what he had was really whipped cream, and he never overbed it. And he always had like a big pot of whipped cream there. So if you had a Sunday, or even if you had a, a black and white soda, he always got a shot of cream on the top of it, right? And if he knew you, he got two shots. And uh, well, again, I didn't think he, I, he never knew me that well. No. How come he knew you that? Well, he used to let me make my own, so. <laughs> He made many of ice cream sodas for me. Well, we used to make it in there. We used to make it in Algios. Uh, and you know, the other good ice cream shop, and it would smell the best, that was Jacobson's. Jack Lynch always used to eat there. Yeah, sure, that's when they moved across the street. Uh, but they smell. You could take the dog in and get you repair the dog. Yes, because Anna, he wants it. Like, I spike gotta go. <laughs> Al, <laughs> yeah, Rex. Uh, 
babies and what have you, and foils in the back room. He ran just a very nice. Will you let the man go ahead, Spike? Okay. So